Hey, what's up, guys? This is Tony from the band Mest and London Falling, and you're listening to Collision on Voice FM. Right now, you're actually touring Japan, aren't you? Yes, I am. So, how long have you guys been on the road in this cycle? Because you're coming to Australia as well, but you've been out for a while, haven't you? Yeah, we just finished up the U.S. run, which was seven weeks long, 43 shows, something like that. It was pretty brutal. Not many days off in between, but uh, we just wanted to go out and hit up pretty much every market that we could. So, so we did that, and then we had about 10 days off, and came over here and had our first show last night in Tokyo, and then we play Tokyo again tonight, play Kobe tomorrow, and then head over to Australia. Yeah, and it's actually, it's double hard on you, because you're singing with two bands on this tour. Yeah, yeah, I do, uh, you know, the support slot with London Falling, and then go back on stage and do a headlining set. So yeah, it's pretty brutal. I made it through the seven-week tour pretty good. You know, there's times where your voice gets a little sore and tired and, and scratchy, especially too, if like, you know, we have a good night of partying or drinking and we're up late. You know, not having rest, it'll just drive my vocals out. My vocal cords are really, really bad. And then on top of that, we also do like a VIP acoustic set before the show even opens, before the doors. Right. So I do the acoustic thing, then the London Falling set, and then the mess set. So yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty brutal. And I guess once you like now have gone overseas and you've got the travel and being in a strange place on top of it, it probably adds to your stress levels a bit. You know, there's the jet lag and stuff, but um, lucky for me, at home, I don't usually go to bed till around 4 or 5 a.m. every night. Yep. Me and my son are on way different schedules because um, his mom works nights and stuff, so you know we're sort of on her schedule. And so uh, around 4 or 5 a.m. is pretty much the time that you guys go to sleep, so it actually works out pretty well for <laughs> traveling and then coming here. I'm actually more on your guys' schedule than I am in America. Awesome. Can I actually go back to the start of MEST? Because you started it with your cousin and a friend, and but then your brother joined. Well, the conception of MEST was in... 1995, me and my brother had been in bands. My cousin, Matt, is the bassist of that. Mm-hmm. He was in the bassist. And then my brother, Steve, he was the original guitarist when we had first started in like 1995. And he was the guitarist until around, I would say, 1997-ish. And then it was just like the brother sort of feuding thing where it, we didn't really get along being in a band together. And I was sort of like, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, we just fight. It's not fun. And, and musically, like, I wanted to do what I wanted to do, and then he was sort of getting into other stuff that wasn't really our sound. So I just sort of said to the other guys, to my cousin Matt, the bassist, and the drummer, I said, hey, you guys can play with Steve. I go, I'm, I'm not kicking him out of the band or anything. I go, but I'm going to play by myself. If you want to play with me, that's cool, you know. And my brother left the band in like 97, and then I asked Jeremiah if he wanted to play rhythm guitar in the band, and uh, Jeremiah was my brother's good friend. Jeremiah's younger brother, Josh, was one of my best friends growing up. Um, so that's how I knew Jer. But yeah, so Jer joined the band in like 98, and we finished, we had uh, like 10 songs recorded. We went back in the studio, recorded another seven, and then combined that into our first like DIY record that we put out called Mo Money, More 40s. And then uh, 99 is when we got the phone call, and uh, Maverick Record was interested and got signed. And how excited were you guys when you got that phone call? And uh, I mean, that was amazing for me, because, you know, I got fucking kicked out of high school when I was 15. So for me, it was music or nothing. That was sort of how I saw it. And, you know, there was a lot of naysayers and a lot of, you know, family members or friends, you know, that would talk shit and, you know, thought that I was making the wrong decision and I needed to go back to school and yada, 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 all that fucking bullshit. But I always knew that I was going to play music. There was something like, I just knew it, you know? And so when people would ask me, like, well, what about, you know, what if you don't? What's your backup? I was like, I don't have a backup plan. I'm not going to do that because if I have a backup plan, then I'm setting myself up for failure. You know what I mean? Like, there's not full drive in it. Mm -hmm. So this is what I was going to do, you know, from the age of 15. I knew I was going to play music. And so, you know, when I'm 19 years old and all of a sudden I'm signed to Madonna's record label, it was sort of like a, I did it, you know? Like, it was proved everybody wrong. And then on top of it, I'm like, fuck, you know, I get to play music, you know? Like, it was, yeah, it was, it was pretty awesome. Yes, it's allowed you to actually be able to make a full-time career out of music, but when you aren't touring or playing or writing, what is there something you do? I know you have a young child right now, but is there something you like to do that when you have um, some time off? You know, honestly, when I'm not writing music or on the road, my life is 
pretty fucking simple. I live in a small town, about five hours from Los Angeles, two hours from Las Vegas. So and it's like sort of like a, a, a party sort of weekend town that people come to. And like the holidays are really big there. And uh, it's like one of the hottest cities in the world. So we spend a lot of time at the beach and on the water and stuff like that. And I honestly, I just go to the gym a couple hours a day, keep myself in shape because I've really fucked up back. And I hang out with my kid. Like it's pretty simple, you know. And, and honestly, writing music is very, very time consuming. So having a one and a half year old child and trying to write songs is fucking, it's very hard to do because, you know, he doesn't give a shit. He, he doesn't know that I'm, you know, trying to play music or trying to write music. So I have to, his needs have to come first. And if I want to write a song or I'm inspired to do something, but, you know, my girlfriend's at work and I have my son, that's, you know, he has to come first. And, you know, lucky for me, my parents live about three minutes away from me. They actually moved to the town that I live in because they wanted to be around their grandson. So lucky for me, I have my parents there to help me out a lot. So if I like have something like a deadline coming up where I need to write certain songs. Like I worked on a movie and I had to write a bunch of songs last spring. You know, I'll wake up in the morning and hang out with my kids a little bit, feed them breakfast or whatever, and then take them over to my parents' house for a couple hours, drop them off, go back home and work and stuff. But, you know, it's like, I like to spend time with my kids too, so, like, you know, my parents aren't a fucking daycare center, but they're definitely, you know, here to help. So, well, it's pretty simple. I'm looking at your Twitter page and I, I love your profile picture, but I see you've got a family picture and it looks like you and your father are very similar. Is that your father sitting next to you in the photo? Oh, yeah, yeah. he's sitting in the chair. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, this old man. That's my dad. And then that picture that's in my parents' uh, backyard back in Chicago. And a lot of those kids in the photo, like my parents are like their parents. You know, like my parents are the parents that sort of raised every kid in the neighborhood at oh, some yeah. point. And a lot of the kids lived in our house and stuff. And then the house across the street from the house I grew up in was the house that my dad was raised in. And my cousins grew up across the street in the house that our parents were raised in. And so we always had a lot of kids over all the time. And that picture was actually the last night before me and my dad got in the truck and drove out to Arizona where we live now. I had already lived in Arizona, but I went home to help my dad pack and do all that shit. But yeah, that was like the last night spent in our backyard. I mean, there's like, our family has like 65 years of history on the block that all the kids hung out on like generations and generations so right, yeah. that's a pretty cool picture yeah you can see by this how family orientated it is but having all those kids around your house growing up probably set you up well to be in a band you don't get a lot of time alone when you're on the road yeah I mean that was the thing with that uh, you know Max wasn't started as like where you know people go and find the musicians to like start a band we were just friends and you know my cousin like grew up with them you know and like my brother and so it was a pretty natural thing to, to start this band crew we were friends and then all the people that we ended up hiring to work for us our guitar tech our merch guy our lighting guy all the people that worked for us you know my guitar tech lived moved in my parents house with us when he was 17 years old and lived there for i think seven years so when we were off the road, we still hung out every day because we were, it was our friends. And then we'd get in a bus and travel the world together, you know, like, so it was cool. I mean, we don't see each other as much these days. And, you know, people have families now and have moved to different states and stuff like that. But we definitely keep in touch. And, and it's one of those things where when you see your friends that you grew up with, you know, it's like, like you didn't skip a beat, you know, it's just normal. Yeah. I will actually, I want to get on to your music because, well, your song Cadillac, that's been a favorite of mine for a long time. But then. Oh, cool. Cadillac and Jaded were probably two of your biggest hits, but then they're quite different songs and it made me think about punk music that, yeah, it's either just, you know, fun and about not much at all or can be really personal and serious. How do you find writing the two different tracks or do you just feel you need to write the the fun and, yeah, and I mean, emotional? Yeah, I that's the thing that because, you know, like a song like Cadillac is just, it's a song about fucking going out and having a good time, you know, it's like a, it's almost like a fucking hokey song, you know, it's a party song. Mm. So when you release songs like that, you have to then sort of fight to let people know that, like, look, like, although we have songs like that, fun songs, like, we write about, most of my shit's actually about serious things, you know, stories and, and relationships and, you know, things that I've gone through, you know, like the song last kid, good friend, uh, his wife's little sister killed herself, you know, she was a mess fan. And, you know, uh, mother's prayers about two friends of mine and the mother has a terminal illness, you know. Walking on Broken Glass is about my grandfather when he got really sick and almost passed away. So there's very serious stuff, but I think at the same time, like, if you come to a mess show, the idea that I've always had when going to a show is, you know, to let these fans and, and kids or adults, whatever, come to the show 
and for three hours, you know, for the show, going to the show, just sort of forget about the world and just have a good time. So although some of the lyrical content can be very serious at times, I think the idea is, you know, you got to, it's about having a good time too, you know, it's fucking rock and roll, like that's what it is. So I think there has to be a balance between the two, you know, like you can't just write, you know, fucking party songs and you can't write the sad songs, you know, and I mean, because when writing, you know, you, I can't just write about one thing. I, you know, go through times where I'm sad and depressed or there's something going on in my life that I need to fucking get out. And then there's times where I'm happy and like, you know, I had a child and like, it's one of the best things that ever happened to me. So I have songs written about that, you know, it's sort of like you fucking, it's like my diary. Mm. that everybody gets to read. Yeah. Can I ask, actually, who you like to listen to or what type of music that you like to listen to at home? I'm definitely a fan of just all the bands I grew up on, you know. I mean, like, any punk rock band you could think of from the early 90s, when it's like, or, you know, late 80s, early 90s, you know, fucking Rancid, No Effects, Green Day, Bad Religion, Face to Face, Social Distortion, The Clash, you know, but then I love, like, DCR, Green Square Water Revival, I fucking love John Fogarty, I think he's a great songwriter. I grew up listening to, like, fucking, the first record my dad bought me was Motley Crue Theater of Pain, you know, so there's, like, I had a an era of my life when I was younger, I listened to like fucking like, metal music and shit like that. I sort of, you know, I like it all in a way. Yeah. I love reggae music, you know. I even listen to like fucking the record Bad Out of Hell by Meatloaf. Yeah. I was raised and like my dad always listened to it. So, you know, it's, I'm used to that record growing up, you know. And she played guitar, so there was always, you know, music being played around the house and stuff. Yeah. Can I ask, is it like, well, of course there is, but to you when you're writing, What's the difference between a Mist song and a London Falling song? Well, the way London Falling actually came about is because when the original lineup had decided to uh, get back together and start touring and, and doing some shows, I started talking to the guys about possibly doing another record, you know, like if we're going to be touring around and shit, like we need to, we might as well put out some new music. And after talking to them about it and, you know, discussing how we'd go about it, if there was enough time to do it, and then uh, about touring, I realized that we wouldn't be able to tour enough to promote a new record because it's not as if we're, you know, we'd probably just self-release it because it's very easy to do these days. You can, you know, throw it up on a fucking, on every digital site with the click of a button. But in order to promote it so that fans would know about it, we'd have to get on the road and do some extensive touring. And the fact that they couldn't made me realize if I'd spend a fucking year writing a mess record and putting everything that I have into it, it would be a waste. So as I was writing songs in that, and you know, during the same process of trying to figure out what I was going to do with these songs, whether it was going to, you know, be put out as a master or whatever, I realized I didn't want to waste, you know, all of the time and work that I put into writing a record. And so I said, fuck it, I'm just going to start another band, get some other musicians that, that are hungry, that still want to tour and want to play music and, and can. I mean, the guys want to, but they've been at their, their real job, so to speak, for like 10 years now. So I just started calling around, you know, I, in the business for as long as I have, I just started hitting up different friends from other bands and they asked them if they were interested in sending in demos. And so that's sort of how London Falling came about. So London Falling for Mess fans, they'll, they'll be stoked because it's essentially the next step of Mess in a way. Mm -hmm. um, but then by starting a new project, there's a little bit of room to be able to explore a little bit with the music. But it's, I mean, if you heard the song Nightmare, which Alternative Press released two days ago, it's very Mess sounding. You know, we're still a punk rock band. Yeah. London Falling is. I'm a little confused, but is Ronnie from Falling in Reverse that you've got in the band? Ronnie, the ex-bassist of I Am Ghost and Falling in Reverse, plays bass in London Falling. Right. So you two are the only ones in the band that we know of. Who else is yeah, in the we, band? Um, we have a drummer who is a mutual friend of ours, but for certain reasons, we're not stating who he is yet, <laughs> I guess. All right. That's okay. We'll have to go to the shows and find out. Yeah. <laughs> Which I should actually mention, you are coming to Australia and you're starting on the 13th of April in Perth. And you've actually got two shows in Perth, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, I think we play and then leave and then come back, right? Something like that? No, you've got the 13th and 14th in, in Perth. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then you're off to Adelaide and Melbourne on the 16th of April. You'll be in Melbourne and the 17th in Sydney. Okay. So you're here until the 24th, but um, people should actually go to Mest Official on Facebook and find out all those dates and where to get the tickets. Yeah, I have a post that has all the links and stuff. So how do you figure? Awesome. What are your plans when you do leave Australia? You've got somewhere else to go on tour? 
I go home, and then, like, a couple days later, April 29th, I have to go to uh, a movie premiere that I worked on of a movie called Highway to Havasu. It's, uh, my good friend wrote and directed it, and then I was the music supervisor and music composer for a lot of it. Um, there's, like, a bunch of mess songs in it, London Falling songs, and then I was actually a producer on it, so I have to go to that premiere uh, April 29th in our hometown. It's called uh, Highway to Havasu. And take some time off, you know? Spend some time with my family and relax and write some write some more London Falling songs. Well, so is that the first movie you've worked on? It is the first movie I worked on. I've had some mess songs in other movies, like fucking Bring It On mm-hmm. back in the day, and then the movie called Not Another Teen Movie. But yeah, this is actually the first movie that I actually ever like. You know, had to watch scenes and then write music, like musical compositions, which I've never done before. But it was a lot of fun. Awesome, and I should actually mention too here that. It is the two-headed monster tour that you're doing, and Hawthorne Heights are also on the bill. Yeah. You've been touring the U.S., and are they in Japan too with you? Yeah. We toured together in 2004. They came out and in the United States and right. did support for us, and it was a full U.S. tour. And as you know, we've been friends with them ever since then, so you see them randomly, like at work tours and stuff like that. And then JT just hit me up through Twitter, and he was asking if I was interested in going out, and uh, his booking agent works at my booking agent's agency. So it's pretty easy just to put it all together. Right. Also, if anyone wants to tour with Mess, try hitting him up on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, pretty easy. I'm pretty, pretty reachable. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask you then, because like your career has been, you know, full of its highs and lows and you have had messed most of the way, although you broke up for a, a couple of years there, but what to you would be a career highlight, like a treasured memory from being in the band? You know, there's a couple. The first time we came to Japan was in like 2001 and getting presented like a gold record. I remember, you know, that was a fucking huge deal to me. That was really cool. The first time that we were played on like MTV in the States when we made like TRL back in the day, like hearing Carson Daly introduce our video, that was fucking really cool. And then uh, summer of 2003, I was laying in bed um, because... I had some back surgery, so I was really like, you know, bedridden for like six weeks after surgery. And uh, I was watching MTV late at night, and it was the singer and then the singer guitarist of uh, 311 hosting some rock show on MTV and hearing them talk about me and that we were on the Warp Tour and that I had a bunch of back surgeries and had to leave the tour and then introducing our video. That was a trip to like, I'm like, it was fucking weird, you know, when you watch that type of stuff. And then mm. um, we've done some of the big late night TV shows. In the United States, like we did the Jimmy Kimmel show, and the guests that were on that day were uh, Zach Galifianakis and uh, you know, Shia LaBeouf. Oh, yeah. Um, it was like when Shia LaBeouf was first starting out. So, like, you know, when you go back and watch stuff like that, it's, it's a fucking trip. It's really cool. Awesome. And then, is there something as a musician that you want to achieve or want to do that you haven't done yet? You know, one thing that I've never had, like, an actual radio hit, like a song that, you know, people just know, like a massive like radio hit. We as a band, you know, we're lucky because we go on stage and the fans sing every word to every song as if it was the hit single. You know when you go see a band live and then they play their, you know, famous song that everybody knows yeah. and the crowd goes crazy and, you know, reacts a little bit more to that song. Because we've never had a hit song on the radio, it's sort of one of those things where they just love every song. So we get that reaction for every song, which is great, you know. But I think it'd be cool to have a song on the radio that, you know, an actual like hit song on the radio. I think that'd be really cool. Well, I've been doing this for fucking 20 years. So. <laughs> well, and that'd lead to your latest release that you mentioned before, Broken Down 2014. Oh, I don't think you mentioned that one, actually. Are we looking at another album in the works soon? For Mast? Yeah. No, I mean, I have, I, I've been debating I might do another um, acoustic record, like the Broken Down record, uh, uh-huh. because there's so many other songs that fans have requested to hear acoustically. Yep. So I might do another acoustic record of fan favorites. But right now, my focus is you know, on the London Falling stuff. Cause I've been talking to managers and labels and figuring out what route we're going to take. So you know, that's sort of where my focus is going to go. But eventually, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I'm sure at some point, Within the next five years, another mess record will be made. But right now, my focus is definitely on London Falling. Yeah, and you, as you mentioned, there's a single up on the London Falling official Facebook page. Maybe the sounds of it. See if you can b- find a record deal before you actually release an album. 
Right. I mean, we have five songs recorded right now for an EP that we were going to release. Mm -hmm. One of the songs is at altpress.com. It's A-L-T-P-R-E-S-S.com. They featured a song called Nightmare. Wow. Um, and we were going to just release these five songs to get some music out there. But then this manager in the States, really big manager, contacted me. And their company is starting a record label that's like a subsidiary of Interscope. And they're interested in doing the record. So we're just sort of talking right now and figuring out what we're going to do. And, you know, if we're going to put out the EP or, you know, go back and write another five to ten songs and put out a record. So we're just sort of sorting that out right now. But I want to get some music out there. So we released a song. Great. And well, one last thing that I'd like to ask you, you're a father. So if your son wanted to go into the music industry, what advice would you give him? What advice would I give him? Yeah. Get a fucking real job. <laughs> no. Um, I, I'm, my kid, whatever my son wants to do, I'm going to support what he wants to do, no matter what it is. If he fucking, you know, he loves the guitar. He has his own little acoustic guitar already. He loves when I play the guitar. He'll bring the guitar to me to play for him. Mm -hmm. um, he loves the drums. He loves music in general. But, uh, you know, if he decided that he didn't like the guitar or the drums and wanted to play the fucking tambourine, I would be like, absolutely, dude. The tambourine is the coolest instrument in the world. I'll get you the best one I can. You know, whatever my son wants to do, I'm going to support. And if he wants to play music, I'm going to be like, cool. But know that you have to put everything into it in order to succeed. You can't half-ass it. Otherwise, you know, some other, some other kid who's starting a band and putting more work into it, it's going to make it before you, you know? So it's like, be prepared for the opportunities when they when they arise, you know? But absolutely, I will support him in, in every way. Yeah, awesome. I will, I'll let you go now because I know you've got to rest and you've got to, like, you've got to rest that voice particularly. I'm making you talk and yeah. it's straining it more. I'll tell people facebook.com forward slash messed official or forward slash yeah. London falling official. And you will be in yeah. the country from Wednesday the 13th of April with Hawthorne Heights and also London Falling. And you've got local artists JC Jackal and Hey Reckless as well along on the tour. Hey Reckless is a band that I actually produced uh, a song with and, and I'm featured on a song I co-wrote with them. They're really fucking good. They're a good, good new upcoming pop punk band. Awesome. We'll have to check that out for sure. But people can actually check them out on the tour, which is the Two-Headed Monster Tour. They can look that up. I'll be sharing all your pages and the tour page on my Facebook page. Cool. Well. Yeah, and um, also my Instagram too, which you could usually post everything there first anyways, is Anthony Lovato. Awesome. Thank you so much. I hope the rest of your Japanese tour goes well, and I really look forward to seeing you in Australia next week. Awesome. If you come to the show, come say hello. I definitely will. Thanks a lot, and have a good day. You too. Cheers. Bye.